I hope you, like me, have been enriched, encouraged by our current Sunday series focus on God is. These are designed to help us in our knowledge and understanding of God, something that God feels is so important that he's okay with us boasting about growing in these areas. As you know, these messages are recorded earlier in the week so we can accommodate the translation and the editing that's all required to deliver um, on Sunday, our service. This week, there were events that happened near the end of the week. And we wanna acknowledge that the news of these events may have left some of you unsettled, frustrated, angry, or just troubled in heart. The recent decision by the grand jury around the Breonna Taylor case, the reigniting of protests in our city and across our country, all these speak to the great depth of the racial divide in our country and the pain that it causes so many. I want to acknowledge that because we're a diverse church, we don't always feel the same way about all the events that happen in our country, and that's okay. We are just required to love each other, to support each other in our diversity and our differences. But for those of you who are troubled and hard, I say to you the words Jesus said in the good news, in the gospel of John in chapter 14. Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust in me. Join with me as we pray to the God that we can trust in no matter what the news is, because his news is always good. Dear God, Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come before you. We know that nothing happens that you don't see, God. You see it all, and you're troubled more than we are by things in the world, God. We know that you have plans that we know not of, God, and your plans will succeed, God. We ask you to let the good news uh, travel through our hearts at times of trouble, God. Let us remember that focusing on you, trusting in you, trusting in Jesus is the way to have peace in our hearts. We love you and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to the online worship service of the New York City Church of Christ. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope you'll be encouraged and inspired by our time today. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 47, it says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Even though we're in a pandemic, we're still devoted to God's word, the fellowship, breaking of bread together, and praying together. Even though we can't meet together physically, God is still doing amazing things in our church. We are so grateful you're with us today. Let's go into the word of prayer. Almighty God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for allowing us to wake up to another day. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to have an opportunity to still come together and worship. In spite of all that's going on around us, we're still able to worship you. God, thank you so much, and I pray that today's service will bring you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm coming up, Lord, yeah, and I'm coming up soon. I'm coming up, Lord, I want to hear my name. Nay, I want to hear my name. Nay, I'm coming up, Lord, I'm coming up soon. I'm coming up, Lord, I want to hear my name. Your Bible, and you read it well. You know the story that I'm about to tell. That I'm about to tell. Well, God 
mighty cold Noah to build a man Good morning, everyone. My name is Matt Rupert, and I help lead the New Jersey campus ministry with Shauna Gill and my wife, Brielle. I'd like to give a quick shout out and good morning to all our New York and New Jersey college students. Good morning, guys. This is the time in our service to give back with contribution, to give back to God and to help God's kingdom here on earth advance forward. To illustrate the importance and the impact of our contribution, I'd like to share some good news. So this morning, I finished a marathon. That's right. I finished a marathon, 26.2 miles, and I made it back just in time for church to be here with you guys. Over the last several months, I've been preparing and planning for it. It's been a difficult and certainly an interesting process, but it's been a lot of fun. But I do remember one particular Saturday. I was going for a longer run, one of these training sessions, and it was above 90 degrees outside. It was very hot. And I didn't know if I could finish my run, but I was running in an area in Northern Jersey that happened to be right down the road from the Novaks, Rob and Chelsea Novak. Rob's going to be preaching here in a little bit. And I texted Rob and asked him if he could leave a glass of water on his front porch. Thankfully, he responded yes. And when I got there on his front porch was this massive mason jar full of ice to the brim and water. It was incredible. I gulped it down. It was refreshing, revitalizing, and honestly, I don't know if I could have finished that run that day had it not been for Rob putting water on the front porch. Now to him, maybe it wasn't a big deal, simple act, but for me, it carried with it so much weight. You know, it reminds me of a scripture here in Matthew chapter 10. As Jesus sends out his 12 disciples into the mission field, he closes his his lesson to them. And here in verse 42, he says, and if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones, who is my disciple, truly, I tell you, that person will certainly not lose their reward. Jesus encourages his disciples and says, man, if someone is generous to you, 
If someone is generous to a disciple, to a brother or sister, they will not lose their reward. Contribution, as we give this morning, is an opportunity to be generous to God and to his brothers and sisters, to our brothers and sisters, rather. It's interesting with contribution that for us, whether it, it's, it's easy or difficult to give, I think the interesting thing is that when we do decide to give, we often don't see the immediate impact of our giving. You don't really get to chase down, well, where, what, what was the impact of this? But I will tell you, when a, when a man or woman decides to make Jesus Lord of their life and get baptized, that's incredible. When a family is restored and the cycle of sin and hurt is broken, that's incredible. When men and women who've been disciples for maybe months or years have repentance and growth and maturity and transformation, that's incredible. Your generosity and your gift, although you might not see the immediate impact, it is going to advancing his kingdom. And so I just want to say thank you. Thank you for your example, New York and New Jersey. Thank you for your generosity and your desire to give to God. Thank you so much. Let's pray together and uh, continue our service. Our Father in heaven, you are a great God. You You have given us so much and provided so much for us. I love in Psalm 23 where you say that you lead us beside quiet waters. We lack nothing. And God, today as we have the opportunity to give back to you, to be generous, please bless our generosity. I know it, it certainly makes you grateful and makes you happy as we give back to you. We love you, Lord. We pray us all in your son's name. Amen. Thank you for your continued contribution to our Hope and Benevolence Fund. Based on your ongoing sacrifice, as well as an anonymous $30,000 donation, we've been able to send a combined $50,000 to the churches in the Caribbean and in Africa. This money will go for food support and ensure that the disciples continue to have food on their tables in these incredibly difficult times. Thank you. In addition, Many of our churches in Africa have not been able to take up any contribution throughout the pandemic and thus have been fighting to meet all of their financial obligations. Because of this great need and your overwhelming sacrifice throughout our special contribution time period, we've been able to send an additional $25,000 to the African Missions Association that they will be able to disperse amongst the churches and ensure that ministry work continues and is continuing to be funded. Thank you. And finally, we continue to partner with Hope Worldwide. We send money there on an ongoing basis to help support their work around the globe as they support throughout many different crises and needs. We're going to watch a video together now to see some of our brothers and sisters in action. Thank you so much. On September 1st, 2019, Hurricane Dorian made landfall in the Bahamas. The Hope Worldwide Global Disaster Response Team immediately began preparing to provide relief. Thank you to all who collectively donated over $200,000 to aid the work. Your donations enabled us to do several things. Six days after the hurricane, Hope Worldwide, along with the South Florida Church, took a boat full of 20,000 pounds of relief supplies, including generators, food, water, clothing and medical supplies for the church and the community. Their generosity helped with food and water and provided shelter for the disciples here in the Freeport Church of Christ. Thank you, Hope Worldwide. Hope Worldwide continued to serve in the Bahamas. Over the last year, funding was provided to clean up, repair, and rebuild homes. A team of trained counselors traveled to the Bahamas to help through the emotional toll a disaster like this takes on the lives of those affected. Even now, funding is helping prepare the Bahamas for future disasters. Hope Worldwide was here on the ground in fall of 2019 and has continued to help us rebuild our homes throughout Freeport, Grand Bahama Island. 
I own was badly damaged by Dorian. Thank you to our brothers and sisters around the world, we have been able to rebuild. We are once again in hurricane and typhoon season, and we anticipate that many outside groups and volunteers will be limited due to COVID-19. I know every person's situation is different, but here's a few simple ways to prepare for natural disasters. You should build a disaster kit for your family. That includes food and water for three to five days, develop a family emergency plan, and follow the advice of your country's emergency management agency. And please always follow the guidelines from the WHO or CDC for COVID-19 safety. There are many great sources of information for disasters, including www.ready.gov, which is available in multiple languages. And of course, be ready to spread hope to your family and neighbors whenever a disaster strikes. We're gonna sing a song called Fill Me Lord. We're gonna start with the women, with the soprano. Fill me, Lord, with your spirit and make me like a leader who has a strong, a strong army. Fill me, my Lord, I pray. Let's have the altos join. Fill me, Lord, with your spirit. Oh, I need your power to guide me. 
Come on, let me hear you. Sing it out. Come on, sing it again. Oh, Lord, and fill me, Lord. Oh, Lord, I'm just a man. church. My name is Rob Novak. My wife Chelsea and I serve as evangelist and women's ministry leader for our campus ministry, and I'm grateful at the opportunity to be able to preach God's word for us this morning. You can be turning in your Bibles over to John chapter 2. I'm recording this on Tuesday, so officially it's fall. Happy fall. And I love our theme for this fall, God is. Steve Kennard and Chip Mitchell did great getting us started, and our topic for today is God is is zealous. My hope for us this morning is that you will see that God is not a distant, idle, or apathetic God. He is passionate. He is zealous. And we, as his disciples, must be zealous for him as well. We see God's zeal here through Jesus in John chapter 2. Let's go ahead and read verses 13 to 17. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, Get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, Zeal for your house will consume me. And in Mark 11, verse 17, it adds at the end, And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. Man, what a powerful story. You know, Jesus steps onto the scene of corrupt religion, and his passion kicks into action. And then it says, zeal for your house will consume me. You know, this was not an uncontrolled fit of rage. This was a spirit-controlled display of zeal. When was the time you displayed zeal? I know two times for me was when Chelsea and I started dating and when we got engaged. And each time I showed my passion for her by engaging in what she loved. First, I'll tell the story of uh, asking her to be my girlfriend. So Chelsea loves music, and I knew she would love if someone wrote a song for her or about her, and I knew if anybody was going to do it that someone was going to have to be me. The catch, though, is I'm terrible at singing, but I did it anyway. And so I recorded, I wrote a song for her, I recorded it, uh, we went to the city together, and I played it for her, and she realized it was me, and then the last line of the song is, Chelsea, will you be my girlfriend? Chelsea, be my Now, I know some of you are cringing right now, and I'm sorry, but you know it was romantic. And so she said yes, of course. Uh, And then after a while of dating, I was ready to propose to her and ask her to be my wife, to marry me. And so I stepped it up a bit, and I did a whole lot better this time than my singing with the first one. I knew Chelsea loved Spider-Man, amongst other things, but I said, all right, I got to figure out how to incorporate Spider-Man into asking her to marry me. And so I got a full body Spider-Man costume, playing this great date with all of our closest friends in the city. After going out to eat, we went down into Times Square. Now, the whole date, 
I was wearing this whole body Spider-Man costume under my clothes. The mask was in one pocket, the ring was in the other, and so I've got this on under me the whole time, and we go into Times Square, and there's all the people out there dressed up that you can uh, take pictures with and, and give money to, and so I step out to go to the bathroom, go in there, take, take off my outer clothing, put on the mask, give all my stuff to my friend John Rodeo, and head back out there disguised as Spider-Man, someone ready to take pictures with. While they were all waiting for me to come back, my friends pointed out, Chelsea, look, there's a Spider-Man. Why don't you go take a picture with him? You love Spider-Man. So Chelsea comes over to me, and we're taking pictures together. She's doing, you know, shooting the web. She's uh, enthusiastically taking these pictures. No idea that it's me the whole time. We take a big group shot, and then finally they're going to walk away. I tap Chelsea on the shoulder. She turns around. I get down on one knee, take off the mask, and she's floored that it was me in there the whole time. I ask her to be my wife, and of course... She said yes. You know, each time, both asking her to be my girlfriend and to marry me, I was incredibly passionate. I was excited. I was willing to get uncomfortable. I went big. I did what would make her feel loved. I showed my zeal for her. And this is what God is like. This is what God is like for us, but even far greater. He's consumed with zeal. Isaiah 59 verse 17 about God says, He wrapped himself in zeal as in a cloak. And so we get this image, God is wrapped in zeal, and he's consumed with zeal. Our God is a wholehearted and passionate God. But John chapter 2 is also a teaching moment. His disciples were there watching, learning, and that's a disciple's mindset. I'm trying to be like Jesus. What is he doing? What is he saying? Let me try to be like him. And so let us have, let us have that mindset this morning as well. Jesus is teaching us to be zealous like him. And so what is zeal? Zeal means great energy or enthusiasm in pursuit of something. Zeal is passion, fervor, wholeheartedness, and it's active. It's in pursuit. The Greek word zealous literally means heat. Zeal is, is heat. It's like fire or boiling water. And so our God is zealous. He, he is not flaky, he is a fire. God is not cold, his heart boils over. Now, zeal isn't being obnoxious or extroverted. Zeal is not a personality trait. It is a condition of the heart. Zeal is deep and internal. Zeal is not something you're born with, it's something born within you. It's who God is, and it's who we need to be for him. And so what is God zealous for? Well, John 2, 17 said, Zeal for your house will consume me. God is zealous for his house. 1 Corinthians and Ephesians teach that God's house now is the church. And so I have two points for us this morning on how God is and we are to be zealous for his house. My first point, God is zealous for honor. In his house. You know, those who traveled to Jerusalem for Passover had to buy their sacrifices at the temple. And that's where this marketplace was set up with overpriced animals and unfair currency rates. And Jesus steps into the scene and commands, Stop turning my father's house into a market because God's house is a holy place. God says in Ezekiel 39 25, I will be zealous. For my holy name. You know it all breaks God's heart. But he could expect to find unrepented sin, corruption, and injustice in the world. But he doesn't accept the world in his house. So we must be careful not to bring division, favoritism, greed, impurity, or ungodly ambitions in, but rather drive it out like Jesus. The church is not a place for the passions of the world but for the passion of God. There's no question that Jesus' greatest passion was God. And there's no question that Jesus is passionate for us. But what are you passionate for? What consumes you, your heart, and your thoughts? Are you passionate for an education? How about desire for a spouse, career success, the election, social causes, investing, maybe a hobby, 
right? And these can all be great things. Some are even encouraged by God. But we must be careful that they don't consume us. Your primary pursuit as a Christian is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And to love means to honor, to obey, to have passion for. And so this is why Proverbs 23, 17 can say, Do not let your heart envy sinners, but always be zealous for the fear of the Lord. Now we can't let our hearts go certain places. Worldly desires, bitterness, pride, and discontentment can all absorb our fire for God. And what we're most passionate for is what we most prioritize and pour ourselves into. And so what or who are you most set on pleasing in your life? That's what you worship. If God sees that the passion that's meant for him is given elsewhere, he won't just be zealous, he will be jealous. Exodus 34, 14 says, do not worship any other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. This idea is like a faithful husband or wife with a cheating spouse. And in the Hebrew, the same word means zealous and jealous. The context determines which is used. And so we could either be passionate for God in his house, or be an unfaithful spouse. The context of our heart will decide if we arouse his favor zealously or fire of his jealousy. In Romans chapter 10, verse 2, it tells us that we can be religious and zealous, but not for God. Zealous for the wrong things. Zeal without knowledge. You know, most of us have passion, but what is it for? Now, I think often the issue is not an absence of zeal, but rather zeal being misplaced. The zeal that's meant for God, the passion meant for God being put somewhere else. And so this morning, what are you most zealous for? Is your zeal misplaced and making God jealous? Or is your zeal for God and responding to God's zeal for you? You know, I want to encourage you this morning to turn your heart to God. Only God deserves to be your greatest passion. Only God deserves to be who you honor, who you worship, who you most prioritize and try to please. Everything else comes after him. Let's always be zealous for the Lord. He deserves it because he is the only God. He is zealous for his honor in his house. And he is the one who saved us and brought us into his house. Let us be zealous like God is, for his honor. And secondly, God is zealous to save in his house. You know, Jesus zealously coming to save us was spoken of centuries before he was born. Listen to this passage in Isaiah chapter 9 prophesying about Jesus coming. I'm going to read verse 2 and then 6 to 7. Isaiah 9 verse 2 says, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Verse 6, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness From that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. You know, still today, we live in a land of deep darkness. But the greatest problems in our world, the deepest hurts, and the the plague of sin have a solution. It's Jesus, right? Jesus is the light that shines into the darkness. Jesus is the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. It says there's no end to the greatness of his government and peace. He upholds his kingdom with justice and righteousness forever. Now as disciples, we do not primarily follow any other person, passion, political party, or philosophy of this world. We follow Jesus. 
We already found the perfect one to follow, the right one to follow. We found the one who saved us, right? And he is our king. His law is perfect. His word is truth. And he has given us peace. You know, when hurting, mistreated, or facing hardship, God is not absent or ever lacking in what we need. He cares deeply and can provide us a peace that passes understanding. You know, this year, 2020, has been a hard year for everyone. I know I've certainly had tough and dark moments, especially watching family members go through challenges and pain. And in those times, my pull towards stress, worry, and being disheartened is strong. It's real. But through it all, I'm so grateful that I can cling to God's love for me and rely on that and trust that. And plus, no matter what happens here, we have solace in knowing that there is a sinless place of eternal pr protection and provision prepared for us in heaven. You know, in God's house, you certainly never need to question God's zeal for you. You know, this morning, I urge you to cling to God's zeal for you, God's love for you. But also know that the love that God has lavished on us, he is zealous to bring to others as well. Jesus' house was always meant to be a city on a hill and to shine as a light to a world in darkness. You know, after driving out the temple in Mark 11, verse 17, Jesus, Jesus says, and, and as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations? You know, Jesus is clear. His zeal was for his house to be a place for all nations to come to him. And man, what an inspiring vision. God's vision is for every kind of person from all nations to unite in Christ as a family and to find peace in him. And that's our mission, right? Driving out the temple took place in the outermost section called the Court of Gentiles. It's where non-Jews could come to seek God. And so Jesus' passion was fueled that day because those there who should have been zealous to bring others to God in that area had corrupted their religion, making it self-consumed and inward-focused. Jesus was saying, this place is meant to be where all nations come to me. Stop making it about something else. They were disregarding and distracted from the mission they were given. You know, when we're not outward focused, we're inward focused. We get inward focused. And then our Christianity gets corrupt and it stops being like Jesus. Right? And that's why it's so important for us to stay outward focused. To stay passionate about what Jesus was zealous for. And Jesus was zealous to save. An account of him clearing out the temple is also in Luke chapter 19. The same chapter where Jesus says, The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. It's the same chapter where Jesus weeps over Jerusalem. And says, If only you knew on this day what would bring you peace. Right? you got to hear Jesus' heart there. God wholeheartedly wants to bring people peace. Right? Isn't that what all people need? And that's what his mission is all about. Right? God is not callous, but zealous to spread the gospel. And if you're sitting there thinking, man, we talk about this too much, or we don't need to talk about this, I'd ask you to reflect, would you say that? about something you're passionate for? Do you realize just quite how passionate to bring peace and save the lost Jesus is? You know, during Jesus' time here, saving the lost is what he said he came to do. It was his passion, and it's what he made his church to do. And so it should be our passion as his house as well. I was baptized almost 11 years ago on campus. And when I saw the cross and the lostness of the world, I knew nothing mattered more than me being saved and bringing Jesus to others. We get to be part of the most important work in the world. I love being part of the mission. 
And I love being part of the campus ministry on that mission. You know, our little New Jersey campus of about 10 people has seen over 160 people become Christians in the last 10 years. Amongst those are two of our closest friends, Bobby and Hannah Ritter, who became Christians in campus, went on to get married, and just this last year had their first son, Edward. And Bobby now serves as the chief financial officer of our New York City church. Along with them is our other close friends, uh, Hannah's sister, Leah, who became a Christian in our campus, Mary Genesis Serviano, and just this month, they had their first daughter, Ellis. You know, even recently, God is moving across our entire New York City campus ministry. In just the last two and a half years, our whole group of about 140 people has had 120 people baptized into Christ. And there's amazing stories amongst this, like Stephen Oguaya getting onto Brooklyn College campus where we had no brothers, meeting Ben, him becoming a Christian, and now leading the way in Brooklyn. Also, Osarena, who became a Christian up in an Albany church that we support with special contribution, coming back home to Staten Island, meeting a young woman named Jada at CSI who became a disciple and is now a faithful, zealous young woman in the Brooklyn campus ministry. And just this week, Jada's younger sister, Madison, got baptized in the Brooklyn teen ministry. There's stories like Vinny DeLuca in New Jersey. You know, Mark Persing met Vinny on campus. Vinny became a Christian. Then he reached out to his friend, Josh Silva, who became a Christian. Josh met Lucas on campus, who became a Christian. And Lucas met Micaiah on campus, who just got baptized two weeks ago in New Jersey. You know, there's amazing stories like this happening. Leslie Madison moving over to Harlem, and in the first year she was there, doubling the number of women in Harlem. We have an amazing group of sisters in the Harlem campus ministry. Even this year, despite the pandemic, 30 students have made Jesus Lord. Some of these were met for just the first or second time at their baptism as all the studies were done over Zoom. You know, we even had two people baptized in one day. The Long Island Campus Ministry has more than doubled this year. God is moving in amazing ways through his zeal. And amongst those 30 people this year, over 10 nationalities are represented. Guys, we live in the greatest place to fulfill God's vision of making disciples of all nations. And I want to remind you that zeal for the mission is not a campus ministry thing. It's a Jesus thing. In Romans chapter 12, verse 11, God calls us, Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. You know, we may lack in our zeal at our times, but we can't stay there, right? God is calling us to refuel our zeal, to never be lacking in zeal, to keep our spiritual fervor. And again, we may have fervor, but it's got to be spiritual and serving the Lord, right? We got to keep our spiritual fervor. How is your zeal to save others this morning. You know, I've certainly needed to refresh my passion for God. And if that's where you're at today, let's refuel that passion. So what are some ways that we can refuel your fervor? You know, we can meditate on God. We've got to get some time in the scriptures, some time in prayer, focus on God's zeal, who God is, his character, and gain some zeal from that. You know, what else can help is to remember your story, to remember when you were lost and when you were saved. To think about all the ways God has worked and, and, and helped you in your life. Not just remember your story, maybe tell it to somebody else. Remembering your story can refuel your zeal. You know, another thing is looking at the crowds with compassion. That's what Jesus did in Matthew chapter 9, was he looked at the crowds and he saw them as harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. It can fuel our zeal to look at the world and realize that they don't have what we have in Christ. And to want to bring that to them as well. You know, and sometimes what can fuel our zeal is just stepping out in faith. Right? Really believing, okay, God, I know you want this and I know you want to use me. And stepping out and just doing something that requires faith. That requires relying on God. And I really believe that as we rely on God, what it said in Isaiah will be true for us as well. The zeal of the Lord will accomplish this. You know, this week, how can you refuel your zeal? This week, how can your passion for God kick into action and be displayed? Ask some specific prayers and look for God to answer. You know, is there someone you could pray for or pray with? 
that you could serve or talk to and then ask them to study the Bible this week. Brothers and sisters, God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but one of zeal to not sit still, but to move and work through you. So let's keep fanning that spirit into flame. Let's have the fervor of Jeremiah, who said, His word is in my heart like a fire. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. Imagine if 50 of us who were lacking in zeal this morning renewed our spiritual fervor. Imagine if 100 or 200 or imagine if all 2,800 of us in the New York City church renewed our spiritual fervor serving the Lord. I would love to see what would happen from that. And I know God does even more. Let us never be lacking in zeal, but renew and keep our spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Now, as we close and take communion, let us remember and reflect on the ultimate display of God's passion for us on the cross. Nothing gives us zeal or shows God's for us as clearly as Jesus when he stepped into our place and suffered betrayal, mockery, injustice, flogging, and crucifixion all on our behalf. You know, our sin earned the wrath of God's jealousy, but instead, Jesus died for us zealously. Let's remember God's zeal for us and always be zealous for him. Let's pray for the bread and for the cup. Father, we want to thank you this morning so much, God, for your passion for us. God, your passion was willing to go to the cross for us. God, we thank you for Jesus, for his life, for his death, God, in our place. God, our sin stirred your jealousy and God, instead of taking it out on us, Jesus died for us. God, in response to that, help us to be more passionate for you than we are for anything else. God, help you to be the zeal of our heart. God, help us to renew our spiritual fervor, to never be lacking in zeal, to have zeal for your honor in your house as you do. And help us, God, to have zeal to save others in your house as you do, as you have saved us. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for this morning. In his name we pray. Amen. precious life for me, for me, because he loved me so. Thank you.
Precious life for me, for me, because he loved me so. Thank you so much for joining us today, and thank you, Rob, for that inspiring message. Thank you for reminding us that God's Word can reside in our hearts and give us zeal for His kingdom. If you'd like to connect with us on social media, you can find us on our revamped Instagram page at NYCCOC or on Facebook. And if you at all would like to investigate the scriptures and see how they apply to your life, how they can give you hope and a plan in your present situation, please reach out to us on nyccoc.net slash connect uh, and study the Bible with us. Now we're going to welcome those who were baptized or restored this past week. Yeah, we're good. Next week, we'll be continuing with our God Is series with a very special message from Robert Carrillo from our LA church. He'll be declaring that God himself is just, that he sees the injustice in the world around us and is working with us and through us to right all things. We love you so much, family. Let's worship our Lord together with one last song. You are the Holy One. Thank you. Come on, in a 
Singing high. 